And the Apostle Paul comes along here and he says uh, something different to Christians than in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Christian or the, the Jew that was saved, the Jew that was in fellowship with the Lord, the thing that happened to him was he was healthy, he was wealthy, he was wise, and God blessed him with a multitude of children and increased his lands and increased his property and his value and all of those kinds of things. Paul comes along in the New, Th uh, New Testament and says in Philippians 3, I counted those things which were gained to me but loss in order to gain Christ. Now I mentioned to you already, it doesn't mean that if you're being impoverished means you're any more spiritual than somebody who happens to have a whole lot of things. But you have to recognize that it is not a sign of spirituality to not have things anymore that in the New Testament, it is a sign of spirituality to have things like it was in the Old Testament. Right. So when you deal with this, and I said this, and it, and it upset some of you, and it's okay, you can get upset with me. I mean, as long as I've been here, I'm sure I'm going to get you upset every now and then anyway. But I said to you that I believe the most dangerous religion now is not Roman Catholicism. I don't, that doesn't mean I'm signing off on Mary and all that other stuff. It's the Charismatics. The Charismatics are the ones that don't teach you anything at all about the judgment seat of Christ and teach you that if you're in fellowship with the Lord that you're prosperous. That's directly contrary to Pauline epistles. They don't preach out of Pauline epistles. All you have to do is listen to them. They're all giving you Old Testament principles and Old Testament scriptures and everything that has anything to do with an Old Testament Jew. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not a Jew. You're the church. And so, so what happens to you is, is you don't see the repercussions of that until you get to the judgment seat. And then you get to the judgment seat and then all of a sudden you wind up naked and ashamed. You have nothing to show for anything you did down here because all you did is pursue earthly things as evidence that you're saved. Listen, you can have it or not have it. That has nothing to do with your spirituality. Sometimes, you know what it has to do with? Your work ethic. Some people have things because they've applied themselves. And some reasons that you're envious of those individuals is because you haven't applied yourself. But just because somebody has it, it doesn't make those individuals wicked either. Now, we've done the antithesis or the opposite of what they did in the Old Testament. The Jew would look down his nose, as for instance, at a Gentile because they weren't as prosperous. And to them, that meant that God wasn't with them. Well, in the day and time in which you live now, it's just the opposite. If you're a Bible believer, the attitude is, is if you have anything nice, you drive anything nice, you wear anything nice, you have anything nice, you eat at nice restaurants or whatever, well, you must not be spiritual. Well, that's not true. You just have the money to be able to pay it or you got good credit. One, I mean, looks can be deceiving. Just because somebody's got it, it doesn't mean they're not in debt up to their eyeballs and having to work 20 hours a day to pay for it. But... Do you understand? So you have to be careful as a Bible believer not to all of a sudden make this thought or this idea in your mind that because somebody doesn't have it or has it, that it equates to spirituality at all. It doesn't. It doesn't make a difference in any way, shape, or form. Now the Apostle Paul says that. Can you turn those two lights on, please? The Apostle Paul says this, and I mean Peter says this in 1 Peter, and then we're going to go to 2 Corinthians 12. Notice what he says in verse number, oh, pick it up in 18. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 18. Honor all men, or 17, love the, brother, uh, the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants be subject to your own masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the froward. So he's telling you that you have to submit to the leadership, even if you don't like the leadership. Amen. Do you see that? That's what you do to your boss for a paycheck. You, but it's a biblical principle. You're still there. He's the one signing the check, so you have to do what he's asked you to do. Are you with me so far? Okay, and I don't want to stop on that one. Paul, uh, Peter says this, For this is thankworthy, that if a man for conscience toward God endure grief and suffering wrongfully. He's talking about enduring that from somebody that you're working for. Do you see that in verse 18? Do you see that in verse 17? You know what he's saying? He said, you have to do what you want to do. Listen, don't tell me that when you get out here on a straightaway and the sign says 55 miles an hour that you think to yourself, I don't want to go 55, I want to go 75. And the authority says 55 and you're like, well, this is stupid, man, to go 55 miles an hour. They must have set up a speed box over here or something or a trap to try to catch me. I mean, what's the problem? I know how to handle my car. 55. Well, I think I can drive 75. He said, submit. You say what? To a speed limit sign. You say what? It's a test of your spirituality. 
<laughs> Submission's always a test to your spirituality. Your relationship with the Lord starts with submission. It starts with surrender. It starts with throw up the white flag. You know how hard that is to do when you have to submit to somebody that you don't like? You know what we tend to do with that? We don't do it. Notice what he says. It's thankworthy and a conscience toward God enduring grief and well, for thankworthy from who? Who's thanking you for doing that? God's thanking you for doing that. Well, that's a pretty good thank you, isn't it? Yes. Notice what he says. For though what glory is it if when you're buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently. In other words, you did something worth getting your hind end tore up for. Oh, well, you should get your hind end tore up for it, right? Amen. Your kids say, well, you shouldn't be, you know, giving me whatever the form of punishment is or the time out or going to bed without a meal or whatever it might be. Uh, but you did something wrong. You deserve the punishment. But then you come in along the way, and in the case here is, is that if you did it wrongfully, you're getting what you deserve, you reap what you sow, don't be griping about it. But then he goes on to say this, but if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Acceptable with who? You say, what is it to take it patiently? You know what patience is? It's enduring whatever it is God has you enduring, the grief and the pain, the suffering and the sorrow, and in doing it without complaining. People think patience is just enduring it. No, it's enduring it without complaining. That's good. It's, patience. it's hard to keep your mouth shut, isn't it? All right, come on down here. For even hereunto, the Bible says, verse 21, where you called, because Christ also did what? suffered for us, leaving us an example. How did he suffer? It wasn't just at Calvary. He was constantly under the scrutiny of individuals that were over him. What did Jesus Christ do when he was told what to do by Pilate? He submitted. What did he do when they came over there and handed him a coin and said, which one? You know what he said? He said, whose name is on that? And he said, Caesar's. And he said, okay, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. There's no conflict here at all. Not one time is he anti-government. He's that government is there for a reason, for a purpose. And I have to learn it. I can't teach you to rebel against the government. If I'm going to rebel against the government, well, I'm Jesus. And so for me to rebel against the government, it's okay. But y'all don't rebel. You know what he said? I'm setting an example. That's a hard thing. You say, why? Somebody's keeping a record of that. Somebody's watching that. The suffering there is not just the physical suffering that he's talking about. It's the pain and agony of not being accepted and not being appreciated. His whole life began that way. Right after he's born, Herod the king at the time is trying to find him under the lie or the guise of to let him know where it is so we can worship him. He wants to kill him. He winds up wiping out that entire town of individuals because he wants to get rid of him. And they go down and hide in Egypt until he winds up dying. He spends his whole life on the run. And what did he do? He continued to endure the grief and the suffering. You say, why? It's thankworthy. Come on down just a little bit further there. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. No, no trickery, no, no foolishness, and not uh, uh, bait and switching and those kind of things. I'm telling you, just like it is, straight up. This is how it is, and this is what's going to be. And if you're going to be a Christian now, when the Apostle Paul comes along here in just a minute, you know what you're going to see? You're going to see a mirroring of what Jesus Christ did. Paul says to you in Colossians, I'm here to fill up that which was left behind. Not that, the Lord, that Paul is completing the, 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 uh, the atonement. Paul is making an example to you Gentiles that you understand that what Christ suffered as a Christian, you're going to suffer the same things. And if you understand that, that Paul's life mirrored Jesus' life, it makes it easy for you to realize, well, if Jesus did it and Paul did it, then I have to learn to accept that I need to get, learn how to do that. Amen. But can I say this to you? It is contrary to how our flesh feels. And it is contrary to the modern world. The modern world is not about submission and subjection. The modern world, even the modern pulpit, is about individualism and you doing whatever is right in your own eyes. You're actually in the book of judgment, uh, Judges historically where every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. And so it's all about everybody's a winner and everybody's a leader and everybody's in charge and everybody's that. Not biblically. Biblically, there's a hierarchy. You say, what does it do? It causes suffering. 
a kid has to go to Sunday school, um, has to go to school, high school or college, I would say that after they get out of junior high school, you know what they have to do? They have to sit there and listen to a teacher and make the grade when they know that the teacher's wrong. Or now look, they can stand up and object and not get a degree. Or they can listen to what they're being taught and then when they're finished with the class, it's not I'm going to go get a sign and pick at the class, you're in their class. So what do I have to do? The object is I'm going here not to have an argument with you over creationism versus evolution. I'm in your class because it's a required requirement that I have to have in order to pursue the degree. That's not compromise. Now if you think it's compromise, most of you that think that, you've already graduated college. And it wasn't as bad as it is now. So a kid has to sit there that's been raised right and taught right and acted right. And you know what they have to do? You say, what is that? That's submission. Doesn't mean that they're morally corrupt and morally bankrupt. And what I don't like is, is people that think that they have a right to tell kids that they should object to that because you don't have to bear the repercussions of that. I mean, what do they have to do? That's called life. As long as it's not illegal or immoral, you know what you do? You, that's called character. You have to learn to do things you don't like to do because it's right to do. You don't always get your way. You're going to work for somebody, guess what's going to happen? You're going to work for them and they're going to adapt what they want you to do or there's going to be conflict. Now notice what he says. This is important for you to get. Jesus Christ wound up doing the exact same time, uh, the exact same thing. He set an example for us. And then he goes on to say, who did no sin, neither was guile in his mouth, who was then reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. So you know what he said? He said, I'm going to do what the Father tells me. You see the submission? The Lord prays, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The Lord prays in the garden and asks the Lord, the, the Father, to take away the cup. And the Father says, no, I'm not going to do it. And you know what the Lord says? Nevertheless, not my will, but isn't that interesting? The Lord practices what he preaches. You say, who was that thankworthy to? The Father. The Father said, that's my beloved Son. He does what I tell him to do even if he doesn't like it. You know what you find the Lord doing on a regular basis? The Lord, even though He is God manifest in the flesh, you know what you find Him doing? A oh, Father, what would you have me to do here? A oh, Father, would you please do this for me? Father, could you heal this person here? You find Him always under the umbrella of, some, of authority. It's a biblical principle. That's why we struggle with it. You know what Cain said? You know, well, tell me what to do. You have five I wills that are over there in the book of Isaiah, but you find those same I wills that are in there when it comes to Absalom coming against David. Five times he does the same thing. You say, what happens? You see, Absalom thought he was coming against David. He wasn't coming against David. He was coming against God. And God took it personal. Now, you can recognize that or not recognize that, but I want you to consider this, ladies and gentlemen. Is it possible that the things that are occurring in your life is God's attempt to try to show you things about yourself that you'd just rather not see? I've seen things in the last three or four things, in the last three or four weeks in my life that I, I don't know, I guess I knew they were there. I don't know that they were as obvious to me as they have been in the last three or four weeks. And it's God's attempt to come at me and say, you got a problem right here. It's funny when you get older, you know what you think? You get to thinking you got it all down pat and everybody else is the problem. I found in talking to a young man the other day and by the time he got finished with all the stuff he was talking about, I said, well, brother, I said, you know, it's an, it's an easy thing to find uh, the chinks in everybody's armor because they stand out. I said, but not one time in this entire conversation have you said anything at all about what might be going on in reality with you. Why are you so critical of everybody else unless somebody's being critical of you? What, why, why are you doing that? What do you mean, why am I doing it? I said, you called me. You live 30-something states away, and all you've done is, is tell me all these other kind of things going on. What's God doing in your life? This is what I got. I said, brother, honestly, really, I mean, you've told me all these things. They may all, every one of them may be true. And I said, but the bottom line is, is they're not on the other end of the phone. You are. What's God doing in your life? Amen. Is it all just, you know, rainbows and unicorns and popcorn and candy? Or 
When's the last time that the Holy Spirit dealt with you? And he said, well, why would you even say that, preacher? And I said, because you're, you're, it, it is a, called a deflective technique. And what you're doing is, is you're trying to drown out God talking to you by talking about everybody else that has problems. I said, that's cheap, easy preaching, brother. It's easy to find the sins and the faults in other people. It's hard to look in that mirror. But I said, if you want to grow, I said, learn a lesson from somebody that's been there, done that, got the t-shirt, coffee mug, placemat, pen and pencil set, baseball hat, bathrobe, monogram towels. Uh, I said, brother, the problem is, is that, Lord, what would I have me to do? I said, people are messed up as a soup sandwich. And you're a people. And I'm a people. I said, you might just extend the grace. And I said, but now let me just say this to you. I would not dare give them any more grace than the Lord's given you. I wouldn't give them one ounce more than God's given you. I appreciate the conversation. And I, it's nice talking to you, you know. Okay. He said, well, that's because you told them right. No, I'm, I'm looking at me. I don't have it all down pat. I don't claim to have it all down pat. You may think I act like it. I don't intend to. It's pretty arrogant. I've been reminded I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Appreciate that. I understand that. Appreciate that. I'm working on it. I, but I'm a long way from being conformed to his image. And I don't mean his body. I mean his mindset. I read my Bible this morning and I'm struggling with a couple of things there. And I'm looking and I'm going, man, I don't see Christ in me at all in those decisions. I'm glad you do. Praise the Lord. You're on high cotton, man. I'll come up there and join you up on the mountain before you cross into Canaan. But right now, I'm still going up the hill. I look at that stuff and I say to me, I don't, I don't see the Lord in that. Where's the Lord at, David? When it comes to this stuff right here, I under, I'm starting to grasp it. I'm starting to understand it. Uh, as a matter of fact, A.W. Tozer made a statement and he said, It is doubtful that whether God can use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Amen. And the Lord said, Everybody wants to be used greatly, but nobody wants to hurt deeply. The price is not in the intellect. And that Bible say your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Therefore, serve God in your body and or soul and spirit, which are His. Isn't that what he says? I may have misquoted that a little bit. It doesn't belong to him. Uh, that message is, is can God do with you as he pleases? Can God hurt you for your good? What I'm fixing to show you right here, ladies and gentlemen, it's a truth that's in the Bible, and Paul's not getting punished for anything he did wrong. Nothing. Paul's not being punished for being out of fellowship with the Lord. Paul's not being punished for doing something he shouldn't have done because he's wicked and ungodly. Paul's not being punished for any of that. Paul's not being punished because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul is simply in a situation here where God's going to do something for him and he's going to do some things for Paul's benefit, but he's going to hurt him. And he's going to hurt him bad. A fellow said to me one time and he said, I, I really would like to be able to preach like Brother Lentz. And I said, he's a great preacher. And he said, well, how do you reckon you learned to preach that? And I said, Brother, I said, uh, God puts his hand on certain individuals. And I said, you might learn homiletics and hermeneutics and you might learn all the things about great outlines and stuff like that. But I said, there's some things about Brother Lentz's life you don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. And I said, the power he has in the pulpit comes from the pain that he had out of it. I said, the ministry he has from the pulpit came from the misery he endured out of it. And said, what you don't know is the things that I only know of maybe three guys that happen to know of the things that he endured so he might minister to other people. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how he endured it. But when he got in the pulpit, unless you were completely out of fellowship with the Lord, you could tell God's hand was on him. But it didn't come because of the fact that he went to PBI. 
It came from a surrendered life that said, if it costs me everything, if I can be anything for him, hurt me. So that's kind of harsh. Well, but see, what we want is, is the, the show pony effect. I want the church and I want all the things that go with the church and I want the opportunity to preach all the places and stuff like that. Power in the pulpit comes from pain. Power through the letting the Lord do with you what he wants. Like I started off with in 1 Peter. And you taking the wrong even though you're right. And God says, I appreciate it. Transferred into Paul. I'm going to do some things for you, but I'm going to give you power and I'm going to let you write 13 books and you're going to be a blessing to the church a couple thousand years down the line. But that's a tough one. I guess if you were to title that, you'd have to say for mature audiences only. You sure wouldn't want to teach something like this to people that are new converts. You say, why? Well, because, you know, if you teach them that preacher, they're not going to come back. Well, why not tell them how to get the power? Isn't that what they're looking for? The power doesn't come from, uh, from music or come from fellowship. It comes from suffering. Yes, sir. Let me show you this principle here in chapter 12. You just have to preach this through the morning service. Paul said, it's not expedient me for doubtless uh, to glory. I will come with the visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ. Paul, Paul is so humble now. Paul knows it's him. But you know what Paul does? He said, oh, I knew a guy. Caught up to the third heaven. Man, you look at the guy's testimony. You can tell it has to be him. He knows information no one else would know that wasn't there. But you know what he says? I don't want you looking at me like I know something. He said, because it cost me something to have that revelation. Paul's now gone from the chiefest of apostles to the chiefest of sinners. His attitude has changed about himself. Paul has no longer, I'm in charge of the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees and all that. Paul is now a servant. Lord, what would thou have me to do? Paul graduated, but he didn't graduate up. He graduated down because the way up Paul's graduated. Paul's so hard on himself that when he comes over to Romans chapter number seven, he says, the things I should do, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't do, I that I do. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? For I know that in me dwelleth no good thing. Paul talking about himself. Would it be a blessing if the church members in here today said, <laughs> we'd have a revival sure enough, wouldn't we? You know what Isaiah said when he actually saw the Lord? Do you know what he said in Isaiah 6? Woe is them. <laughs> Woe is. No wonder you saw the Lord, Isaiah. Paul comes along down through here in, uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, caught up to the third heaven there, caught up there in the words, you know, unable to speak there in verse number 4. And Paul said, of one will I glory, yet will I not glory, but in my what? Infirmities. infirmities teach you things about yourself you can't learn any other way. Yes, Preacher, what do infirmities do for you? They'll humble you. Yes, sir. They'll prune you. They'll make you fruitful. They'll make your branches stronger if you can endure them. They make you able to minister to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, we go through trouble so we can minister to other people. And I ask you, if that's God's form of seminary for you, would you be willing to let him put you through that? Did you ever realize that maybe God's just putting you in a college prep course, that the stuff you're going through is God preparing you and answering the prayer when you said to him you wanted God to use you, and God put you in a school different than anyone else has been to. Paul's different than everybody. No one had been to this school before except Jesus and God puts you in a classroom and then you run back in your mind. Ask him sometime. You said you wanted to be a minister. You said you wanted to serve the Lord. You said you wanted to, well, yeah, Lord, I did, but in an advisory capacity. I mean, after all, I mean, I already got it all down pat. I already know all there is to know. 
The Lord said, well, I'm the one that put you in that school. Well, Lord, nobody else is in that school. Well, nobody else has the problems you have. You're special. Amen. God has a way of knocking the sheen off, knocking that, the sharpness of that edge off, doesn't he? Yes. Yes. I know this is unpopular. I can tell by how you're looking it's unpopular. You say, what is it? It's too close to the hedge for you. It's too personal because you don't think you have a problem. You don't want God to use you in how he wants to use you. You want him to use you as you are. That's how you get saved. But after you get saved, if you're going to serve, you're going to serve him how he wants you to. Or guess what? He's not going to use you. Amen. Well, I just think, I, you think God cares what you think about that? Honestly, do you honestly believe that? Well, you, some of you think that. I've thought that. You want the Lord to use you in a limited capacity? Just keep doing what you're doing. You know what's a hard thing to sing nowadays? I used to sing it, you know, uh, and I joke about it, and it's not funny at all, but I used to joke about it. I used to sing the song, I Surrender All, I Surrender All. I started singing, I Surrender Some. Because every time I sing that song, the Lord said, All? Oh, Lord, you can take my houses and my lands and take this and take that and all that. Take the dearest thing to me, that song, Whatever It Takes, that my mom and daddy used to sing. It's in my Bible. He said, Whatever It Takes? How about if I take your anger and your wrath and your bitterness? How about if I take your ministry? I mean, there's a lot of things dear to you other than just your spouse and your children and your bank account and your health. Suppose the Lord said, well, that stuff's awful dear to you. You seem to nurse it all the time and take care of it all the time and try to grow it all the time and spend time with it. I'm talking about personal individual stuff right now. It's not what the church wants to hear nowadays. We're all winners. You're a winner because you got saved and you're going to Jesus Christ. You're going to, that's, you're going to be in Him one day and, I, and I'm in Him and He's in me and so on and so forth and I get out of here. But until that, you know what? We shirk that rough road anymore. And the next thing you know, we're missing opportunities for God to grow us. I don't like a pruning hook any better than anybody else. I know just from a tiny little of experience I had that when certain things come along, especially on trees and different things, when them little suckers come up there, if you don't cut those suckers off, you know what it'll do? It'll rob the tree of the nutrients that it needs to grow the right stuff. And you've got to take a sharp hook to it. If you take the wrong kind of blade to the thing, you leave frayed edges on that. And you know what happens? That's where fungus and disease and bugs get in. You've got to, you've got to cut the thing clean, amputate it. That's not fun when you're the one on the table. The old preacher preached a message one time. He's preaching along these lines and he has a list of, he has a guy over here, it's Jesus. And he's got on one of those old leather aprons and he's working there as a blacksmith and he's making a, 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 a knife there and he's got it laid out here, a sword there. And he's got it laid out here on the anvil and it's blazing hot. And he's got the hammer drawn up like this. And then behind him, he's got a list of all these names of all the greats that are in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Not all, but, but a lot of them. And Paul's up there and Peter's up there and Moses is up there. Joshua's up there and the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and those kind of things. And he's like this and he goes through and in that sermon, he shows you how God put them in the fire and put them on the anvil and beat them into the position he wanted them to be in, made them into the shape he wanted them to be. I never forgot that. That picture sitting front and center in my office. You say, well, I look at that every day and I say to myself, can God put you back in the fire or you think you're already formed? Well, I must not be formed. You say, what? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Been in the fire lately. Uh, more than just with what's going on in our personal lives. Whether, whether you recognize this or not, what goes on here is as personal to me as it gets. This isn't something I do. This is what I am. And so all of a sudden it must not be formed. You say, what is that? I see myself lacking in a number of things. And you would think after 60 something years of being saved, I surely would have already learned that stuff. You know what I learned? I must not have learned it or he wouldn't have put me back in the fire. I don't like fire. I like ice better, unless I'm looking at the fire. <laughs> I'd rather freeze to death. You say, why? Because when you're freezing to death, you fall asleep and you don't even know you're dying. 
and then you wind up going through hypothermia and everything shuts down and the next thing you know, the last thing that goes is your heart and then you're croaked and you're gone. You don't even realize it. Your brain's done turned off and everything. Else. But when you're in the fire, I mean, it may be a short time, but man, you're screaming and hollering the whole time you're there. I don't like fire. But the Lord doesn't choose to form me with ice. You say, what? It gets too comfortable with my own image. Amen. Frozen. You get too close to the fire. You know what happens to you? You lose your image. Right. You lose who you think you are. Paul said, I'll glory in my infirmities. He says, why? God's reshaping me. He's remaking me. You know what the epitome, the pinnacle of, of pride is? It's thinking you're already formed. Look at your Christian life. It's kind of stagnant, isn't it? It's kind of stale. It was the last time that the Holy Spirit dealt with you about something or put a burden on you for something. I'm not talking about a burden for everybody that doesn't do it like you do it. I'm not talking about that burden. I'm talking about a burden for something God cares about. Like a mission field. Like Bible school. Like an attitude change. When's the last time the Holy Spirit burdened you with that? Your lack of Bible reading and prayer. When's the last time the Holy Spirit, I mean, put you under conviction because it's been easier for you to talk about other people than it is for you to witness for Jesus Christ? When's the last time the Holy Spirit said to you, you can't even leave a track at the dinner table anymore? At the gas pump? You leave your Bible in the car now? Sophisticated. Can't be doing that stuff. That's kind of interrupt. When's the last time the Holy Spirit dealt with you? You must have him grieved or vexed or quenched. Now you know what he's trying to do? Pull you back in there. The very idea for any of us to think we've already arrived. Preacher, can you hurry up and get done with Sunday schools? I won't be back anymore. Oh, okay. I know that when Paul preached, some heard. I know when Paul preached, some said, I think I'll come back and maybe hear a little bit of that again. Yes. And I know a third of the crowd, you know what they said? I ain't listening to that foolishness again. I'm out of here. Yep. I expect that. But it doesn't prevent me from telling you the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is not God and it's not the church and it ain't the pastor and it ain't the people. The problem is you and I are not letting God have his way in our life. And whenever you're always throwing at somebody else, there's three fingers pointing, uh, there are three fingers pointing back at you. But you'd never look at that. You know what the Lord does sometimes? He puts infirmities on you. And after a little bit of time in the hospital, a little bit of time being sick, a little bit of time with the flu, a little bit of time with the fever, all of a sudden you realize, you know something? All that stuff doesn't make any difference. Paul said, I glory in my infirmity. You say what? It centers me. Watching somebody pass from this life to the next life and realizing you're going to go down that pathway one day soon and then all of a sudden it centers you to go. And when you do, do you think all the things that consume you every single day are going to matter? Your opinion of what everybody else is doing, you think it's going to matter when you stand before him? The Lord's like, I am so glad you are finally here. I have been in a wandering state of mind because I really did not know what to do about these miserable, God-forsaken, good-for-nothing, rotten Christians. And I am glad you're up here in the advisory capacity that you have always desired to be in. Please have a seat right here. I'll vacate the right hand of the Father. And you sit down and you tell me how to straighten out this mess. Because it seems that you think you know more about my kids than I do. You're so quick to blame them for your misery. Maybe I put them there because you're the problem. And the very thing that God's trying to do, we run from it. Because we don't like the vessel that he uses to do it with. We have to stop because it's 1030.
this thing is so important that, that, it, that if it, it, it would not hairlip the devil and upset Christians, I'd just preach right on through and let you get in wherever you got in. Because it is so vitally important for the Christian in the last days. God prepared Paul, showed Paul what we need in 2024, and we have gotten so divorced from it. Yes. From the pattern Paul set, that we can't get reconnected because we got all the things that we need to do in order to have church anymore. And all of a sudden, what should be taken the preeminence, hey. even if it lasts an hour, it, it can't overcome that bitterness and anger and wrath and the people problem. As much as you don't like people, I hate to say this to you, nobody in here, maybe next to my mama. <laughs> I'm sure she bothered somebody somewhere. But I guarantee you, as much as you're irritated by other people, I guarantee you, you irritate other people. And you just refuse to believe that. Let me give you these things real quick. Suffering will make you humble, will make you fruitful, able to minister. It'll give you an ability to empathize and sympathize with other people. It'll prove God's sufficiency in all things. It'll make heaven more real. And it has a tendency to remove your affections for earthly things and set them on heavenly things. We'll take a break and then uh, we'll have our...